So I've been tasked to talk to you uh, the first presentations about the PSC colonoscopy and I'll be talking about why you need one, what's involved and what techniques we use for you to get the best out of your colonoscopy. And then I'll be talking a bit about research around the world as well as here locally and what I'm doing. Um, a bit of background on myself beyond what Martine said, you can probably tell I'm Australian and I studied medicine and gastroenterology in Australia in Adelaide at the University of Adelaide and Royal Adelaide Hospital and then through Dr Chapman I gained a fellowship here for one year uh, as a doctor for my final year of my gastroenterology and hepatology training. And I had only seen, I think, two patients in all my gastro training in Australia with PSC. And I think I saw about five in my first week with Dr. Chapman. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know very much about the condition beyond what I'd read in books and seeing these two patients over um, the two years I'd done gastro in Australia. And Dr. Chapman's enthusiasm, the complexity of the disease and the passion he showed me that I now have for this disease and wanting to do something to benefit patients and to work towards a cure and treatment to help uh, make patients with PSC's lives better. It infused into me and I've stayed on here and I've now been here four and a half years and I'm doing my PhD in PSC and IBD. So that's a bit of background on why I'm here and, um, and where I'm going. So these are my potential conflicts of interest. So why might someone with PSC need a colonoscopy? Well, we, I think most of you know that most patients with PSC have inflammatory bowel disease um, and the majority are ulcerative colitis, although up to 15% <coughs> it's Crohn's disease. And there is this condition IBD unspecified, which is where you have a little bit of each and so you don't fit completely in one box. And to be honest, the inflammatory bowel disease that you get in PSC potentially isn't ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, it's actually its own phenotype, it's its own type of inflammatory bowel disease because it's a particular brand of inflammatory bowel disease you get in PSC where it involves your whole colon, you may get some inflammation of the end of your small bowel, the ileum, which you don't normally get in ulcerative colitis. Um, you uh, often, patients with PSC often have a fairly inactive form of inflammatory bowel disease or at the very least they don't get many symptoms despite there being inflammation there. Um, and there are some other characteristics and they may not have involvement of the rectum, so that the very end which you always have an ulcerative colitis. So that's another topic, uh, which is something I know Dr Chapman firmly believes in that it's a specific type of inflammatory bowel disease that may be a completely different condition from ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. But the point is that if you're diagnosed with PSC and don't already have a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, you need to have a screening, uh, a screening colonoscopy to see if you have inflammatory bowel disease. And the term quiescent means uh, asymptomatic. If you don't have any inflammatory bowel disease at that screening colonoscopy, you should go on to have it checked that you don't develop it uh, in the forthcoming years, uh, every five years. And so what happens if you already have uh, inflammatory bowel disease when the PSC diagnosis is made? Well, you have a colonoscopy as indicated if your inflammatory bowel disease is active, so that's just um, as directed by your inflammatory bowel disease. But when you're asymptomatic from your inflammatory bowel disease, you really should be having an annual colonoscopy. Um, and these, this is recommended by the European uh, Association for Study of the Liver, or EASL, um, ARZLD, which is the American Society, ECHO, which is the European Crohn's and Colitis Organisation, and also the British Society of Gastroenterology, to name four of the main societies that recommend this. I've put a little asterisk there because some of these guidelines suggest one to two yearly rather than one yearly. Um, our feeling is it should only be two yearly in individualised patients. But we don't know necessarily about small duct PSC, whether there is the increased risk of cancer and potentially that could change, but at the moment we still recommend yearly colonoscopy for them. And I'll talk about the other ones shortly. So why annually? So we know that patients with PSC and inflammatory bowel disease have an increased risk of bowel cancer. And it's probably around five to 10 times the risk of someone with ulcerative colitis alone. And we also know that it can occur very early on. So you don't just wait until 10 years after your PSC diagnosis, you start your annual colonoscopy straight off. Um, ulcerative colitis, having ulcerative colitis with your PSC does confer a greater risk than Crohn's alone. There are two main studies looking at this, uh, at Crohn's with PSC. Uh, one was from Scandinavia, which found there was still an increased risk 
if you had Crohn's, and ones here in Oxford uh, by Dr. Chapman and colleagues, which showed that there was no increased risk of cancer if you have Crohn's with your PSC. So it's still a watch list space, and this is probably a, a case where we can individualise and maybe do two yearly colonoscopies without any evidence base to suggest that. Um, if you have no inflammatory bowel disease when you have PSC, you do not have an increased risk of bowel cancer unless you develop inflammatory bowel disease down the track. And as I've mentioned, there are no published studies on the risk of cancer in small duct PSC. PSC itself is a rare disease, and if only 10 or 15% of patients with PSC have small duct, that's rarer still. So there just aren't the number of patients to do a study in this. Um, Dr. Chapman and I are trying to do a study in this, collaborating with our European colleagues, and are still working on that at the moment, because our belief is that we don't think that small duct PSC confers that increased risk, but that's just a feeling at the moment, it's not proven. So should you be worried if you have PSC? You know, I've told you all these facts about cancer. So be alert but not alarmed because despite all of these, uh, there are quite a lot of studies looking at this, it's still only small numbers of patients in these studies uh, and these studies have uh, up, upwards of 200 to 500 patients with PSC. It's still only 10 to 15 in these large studies that are actually getting colorectal cancer. So yes, the risk is increased but it's manageable and it's not huge numbers, if that makes sense. The message is to be proactive in attending your surveillance colonoscopy and also to make sure that you're getting the right type of colonoscopy because there's a lot more that goes into the PSC colonoscopy than you may realise. So this is a study of just over 500 patients uh, in nine centres and these are all patients with long-standing inflammatory bowel disease involving their whole bowel, so not necessarily with PSC and they were asked whether they had had a colonoscopy within the last three to four years, a surveillance colonoscopy, which they should have because they had long-standing extensive colitis or um, yeah, colitis. And what was found is that if you look on the very right-hand side for all, so both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, um, and, and for all the centres, the red line is at 53%, uh, which was the amount of patients overall who had actually had a colonoscopy within the last four years. And it was slightly more so for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, but the point is that the take-up rate of the annual colonoscopy, despite being recommended, is low, and so it's not going to work if you're not actually having the surveillance done. So in terms of um, uh, things that can make your colonoscopy better, the quality of your bowel preparation makes a huge difference as to whether we can see any precancerous lesions or cancer itself. So these are what we want to see is the, is the dirt path on the right-hand side. But if you've got snow and leaves, or you can imagine what they're metaphors for in the way, then, then you're, it's almost not worth doing colonoscopy at all. So sometimes it's, not, it, it's usually not the patient's fault if the bowel preparation is no good because you know, most patients are pretty good at sticking to the instructions, but different patients take different amounts of bowel preparation in terms of the alteration to the diet, the type of laxative that you're getting. And so it's often worth looking at what the endoscopist has said on your report as to how good your bowel preparation was. It should be excellent. And to strive that each time, if it's not good enough, you should be having your bowel preparation changed and your dietary alterations changed to strive for excellent bowel preparation. It's also just a message to really do your best and follow the instructions given. So another thing that makes your colonoscopy better is how slowly the endoscopist withdraws the camera. So um, on the y-axis, on, uh, on the vertical axis, is the rate of picking up dysplasia or precancerous changes. And along the x-axis, along the horizontal, the further along to the right is the longer the endoscopist takes when they're withdrawing the scope, just looking around. And so that line going up indicates that the longer you take, or the longer the endoscopist takes examining your bowel as they come back, the higher chance it is that they will pick something up. And you, you know, if there's something there, you want it to be picked up. So in other words, you need to have enough time, or the endoscopist needs to have enough time and not be in a rush, and make sure that they are actively making sure they're not withdrawing too fast, it's not in the middle of a busy list, um, and that is one reason why we have a PSC colonoscopy list, where we make sure you are dedicated a proper longer slot. This is an example of um, the old fibre optic colonoscopes on the left uh, versus the high definition on the right. 
I don't have our standard definition in the middle, but it is somewhere in between there. But you can see the amount of detail you have of the lines going over the, um, the little bumps, the little areas of dysplasia there um, with the high definition. So you want to be getting your colonoscopy at a centre that has high definition colonoscopy. So a lot of regional centres and some of the main centres don't have high definition, but that is an important consideration for all surveillance colonoscopies. Right, so I've got four different types of imaging here, and this is to do with what type of light is being applied to shine onto the lining of your bowel. So here is the, is the white light, just a normal light shining, and these are the little areas of dysplasia or precancerous areas. This is a new type of imaging called autofluorescence and is being looked at in a study called Find UC, which some of you may or may not have been invited to. And areas of dysplasia come up as slightly fluorescent. Um, and that is very much in research at the moment. It's not a standard of clinical care. Narrowband imaging is a four, it hasn't projected very well here, but it's where they use a filter to take out the red light of the, and you just have blue and green light shining which picks up haemoglobin more in the blood, so it picks up the vascular markings, and you can see the lines covering um, the surface better, and there's a particular marking pattern that we see for dysplasia. And then this is what we use and what the standard is for surveillance colonoscopy, which is chromoendoscopy, where you flush in a blue dye called indigo carmen, and you can see that here where it's not quite so obvious, the blue has gathered around this dysplastic lesion. And so by spraying that dye, you can just pick up the lesions that more easily and you might find things you otherwise would have missed. How do we give the blue dye? Well, there's several ways. Uh, this is all in research, taking a pill. And um, you take the pill and then it goes through your body orally and it gradually disperses and covers, coats your bowel in a blue dye. Uh, you can squirt it down with a catheter that sprays it everywhere. Um, and then you can see the lesion that it's picked up. And then there's also a foot pump, but um, that's more for the endoscopist for um, ease of, I wouldn't worry about that. So in terms of looking at chromoendoscopy, the blue endoscopy versus just shining a white light, this is a, a combination of several studies. Each of these lines is a separate study, and this is a combination of all of them. This is called a forest plot. And where there is no um, benefit of blue light or of blue chromoendoscopy is when it, the line is at one. And the further over it is to the right, the more the benefit of having chromoendoscopy. So if you add up all of these studies, you come up with this line here, which means that chromoendoscopy is 1.8 times more likely to pick up dysplasia or precancerous lesions than standard white light. So for surveillance you, with PSC and IBD, you should all be having at least a chromoendoscopy. So then when we do the colonoscopy and we're spraying the area, um, do we just take random biopsies, which is the old norm, so that you might pick up an area of dysplasia even if you can't see it, or do you target the area? So this is a picture of someone with dysplasia. Um, and then these are the areas where they had their biopsies, but actually the area in white is the area where the dysplasia is, so they've completely missed it. Whereas if they had something, some sort of dye spray to do targeted biopsies, it may have been picked up. And because that's been missed, that could then go on to form a cancer in, in between. And this is another picture here where you can barely see the lesion just with white light and you can see it all gathering around the lesion there. So in terms of taking targeted biopsies versus random biopsies, there was a much higher pickup of dysplasia in patients with targeted biopsies, 8% versus 1% in random. So we have a monthly PSC colonoscopy list, which is run by myself and Dr James East, who is the head of the endoscopy department, and who is an internationally renowned author on surveillance endoscopy techniques for inflammatory bowel disease. The list is performed by myself, um, however, Dr East is often there to supervise me and also I sometimes put patients on his list as well, particularly if the colonoscopy is more difficult. Just to say that I've been specifically trained by Dr East in lesion recognition and making sure that we do this properly for patients with PSC. 
And um, so it does make a difference with who you have do it in terms of having a dedicated endoscopist. <coughs> Are you watching this realising that you haven't had a colonoscopy for a while and need one soon? If the answer is yes, I am putting on some extra lists in the next month uh, for patients with PSC. And please do feel free to drop me a line if you're able to come on any of these dates and you feel that you do need a colonoscopy. Um, I'll put my email address at the end as well and I'm happy for you to contact me. If you feel that you, uh, if you know that you are not at a centre who does these types of colonoscopies, I'm also happy to receive referrals for this list. You will be having it done for clinical reasons in terms of for your bowel cancer screening, but at the same time we would also invite you whether we could take some extra biopsies for research, which I'll talk about shortly, and you're perfectly obliged not to consent to that. Okay, the point only applies to opposite patients, doesn't it? Patients could still get a referral, though, I would so imagine. Yeah, they need a referral. So, so if you... Were so for those of this, that's not going to happen with time frame. So for those of this, mm. it has to be Oxford patients. So Dr Chapman was just saying that this should be for Oxford patients because of this time frame. I wonder whether I could... If there was a fax referral, whether it could be uh, um, worked out. But So it is more for Oxford patients, but potentially we could just see what we could do as well. And can I just say that universally, even at Oxford, annual colonoscopies are not occurring properly. And this is something that I'm looking at with Dr Collier and Dr East about the, why are we failing our patients and not getting annual colonoscopy. So I set this list up about a year and a half ago and the aim is to try and make it a more streamlined process but that's taking time. But I think all around the world it's pretty rare that patients do get their annual colonoscopy which is why it's excellent to empower you, the patients, to, to know so that you can also be contacting us while we're getting our act together to get the service proper.